Okay, good afternoon, listeners. You are listening to the Lament of Hope podcast. I'm really um, blessed today. I'm speaking with uh, Richard Drake. He's a historian who's currently teaching at the University of Montana. And I actually came across him because I was listening to a documentary on Lucretia Borgia um, and just her life story. She was a she was the daughter actually of a pope back in the 15th century. And she, her story sensationalized many times in history now, but this documentary kind of took the take of more of an unfortunate story and just her life as a woman in the Renaissance era in general. So I wanted to ask Richard to come on and talk more about that. Is it something he's studied? Um, Richard, just before we get started, can you, um, just because it's something I'm really interested in because nowadays at least in my circle, especially with the younger generation, being a historian is definitely not really, it's not something that many young people even want to be. I know few people who want to be a historian or even have an interest in history anymore, which is really unfortunate. But I wanted to ask you, um, like, how did you grow up and how did you cultivate a love of history? And why is that something you pursued? Well, I, I grew up in New England in Massachusetts. And um Along about, I, I would say, middle school, I began to develop an interest in um, a writer. His name was Kenneth Roberts. He's an historical novelist. And uh, he wrote some um, classic books, the most famous of which was Northwest Passage and a couple of other important ones were uh, The Lively Lady and Rappel in Arms. They were all novels about the history of New England and especially the history of Native American peoples there, uh, the Abeniki Indians of uh, Maine and the Nipmuc Indians in my native uh, Western Massachusetts. And that got the, reading those books got me started. Uh, I, I developed such a keen interest in what uh, this novelist, this historical novelist had to say mm. about uh, my part of the country, uh, the, the Northeast, that I developed an interest in history and began reading it seriously. And by the time I got to college, I knew I wanted to be a history major and then went on to graduate school after that and eventually earned a PhD at UCLA in, uh, in Los Angeles. And um, my my passion for history has only grown since then. I find it absolutely riveting and there's nothing that interests me more what when you were younger and you were developing this love of history what time period did you find really interesting um well the the time period of uh kenneth roberts novels was mostly the 18th century okay period of the american revolution and the period just immediately preceding that and um so that that's the period that I first began to find fascinating, but as, as so often is the case, I think, in, in everyone's intellectual literary life, uh, one thing led to another. I went from that interest to uh, developing an interest in all American history. And then I, I lived in Europe for a while mm. uh, after graduate school. I lived in Italy for a number of years. And, and became interested in that history as well, which is what led me to Lucrezia Borgia, uh, the subject, the main subject of our discussion today. I found her time period, the period of the late 16th, early 17th, uh, the late 15th, early 16th uh, centuries, a fascinating period mm -hmm. of the Renaissance. Italy's greatest artists were at work then, uh, her greatest writers, many of her greatest writers, were also um, writing their poetry and um, uh, other works in that period. Um, and and that really uh, became my next great passion mm. um, as an historian. Uh, Italian history in general, but especially the Renaissance, and then uh, later uh, the modern era, in which I, for which I wrote my first four books, all dealt with modern Italian history. Um, uh, and, and so, it, as I say, it's sort of a 
when I think about my interest in history, it's almost as if I think of links in a chain. I mean, one link leads to the next, yeah. and uh, there's just no end of the chain. There's just no end of the subjects that uh, history uh, makes available to us. And I, I think they're absolutely fascinating and vital for us to know about. Now, as you've grown in your historical study, as well as I'm sure in your interpretation of history, mm -hmm. how has that changed since you started as you know a college student getting their degree in history? And then how has that changed over time as you've actually applied what you've studied and learned more and more over the over the decades? Well, I, I think the big difference uh, between pursuing uh, history as a as a student, and then becoming a publishing historian, is you have to learn not only about history, but you have to learn about the history business and how to uh, get your material out into the marketplace and uh, publishing, dealing with publishing houses, uh, dealing with uh, the whole process of marketing your book, uh, getting your work known, uh, that that's a different level of challenge, I think, because it's it has more to do with business than it does with stimulating intellectual life. Uh, mm. But in, or, in order to uh, in order to make any kind of uh, impression with your work, you have to get it out there. And yeah. I think this this is a very difficult step for most people to take. It, you, you're you're going from developing an interest to developing knowledge about how to advance your interest in the marketplace. And that's, I think, the biggest change that's occurred from the time when I first became interested in history as a 12-year-old in, in Massachusetts to the way I live my life now. How are you How are you finding an interest for the topics? Like when you're talking about Italian history, the Renaissance period. Um, what have you found as you've been marketing for it? How have you done that, you think, in a way that's engaging to other people or that kind of helps people capture the same interest you have in it? Well, I think teaching is very helpful uh, for a writer. I, I think uh, combining teaching with writing is a very... Uh, um, for me, anyway, a very satisfying combination of activities. And they kind of reinforce each other. I mean, you can tell in a way, uh, as a teacher, when you're trying to interest a class in a subject, in a topic that is of interest to you, but th then the question is, how do you make an interest of people who are several decades younger than you? And uh, I think this can be a way of giving a writer pointers about how to uh, structure his or her uh, books and articles that uh, you, you can learn from teaching. You can get ideas about what works and what doesn't work, what is of interest and what isn't of interest. And I, so I think that's been very uh, reinforcing for me as a writer to have the opportunity to present my ideas in the classroom and in seminars, in, le in the lecture hall. Uh, it's a, it's a kind of like a laboratory for discovering um, what what uh, what what's going to work um, in the marketplace of ideas. Hmm. Yeah. What what do you think makes a good historian? Like, have you changed in how you've thought of that over time, or have you like do you think you've achieved that in the career you've had in history? I think one is always striving to achieve it. I don't think you ever really get to the end of the process, but um, I, I think, I mean, to your, your first, the first part of your question uh, concerning uh, what makes a good historian, I think you have to love the subject to start with. I mean, you have to be passionate about your work. And I, I think that I, I know as I look back on my own career as a student when I was in college and then in graduate school, I mean, the professors who made the deepest impression on me were people who loved what they were doing yeah. and were completely 
committed to it and and it was a way of life for them not just a job it wasn't just a paycheck that they were getting from this but they were getting a sense of fulfillment and i think that's what i try to project in my own work that uh this stuff is is not just of interest because it uh you, you're getting credits toward a university degree but it's it's information you need for your life and mm -hmm. in order to lead a a a full rich civilized life that, that history has great lessons to teach us and i try to get those across in my teaching and in my writing what do you think um personally for you what is history how has history changed your life or studying it kind of almost in some ways it's a food that you have in life um yeah. How have you grown in that? And that's actually impacted your life. You see life differently through history. Well, I think the, the first thing uh, I would say in answer to that very good question uh, is that uh, history has enabled me to think about politics and context. I mean, instead of thinking about political life in immediate contemporary terms only, you know, one thinks about how we got to the point where we now are. And I right. think okay. history is able to teach that lesson as no other discipline can do. Hmm. So in my own personal life, I find that whenever I um, look at the contemporary world, looking at foreign policy or the wars we're fighting or the political campaigns that are underway, the great issues of the day, um, I, I frame them historically. I, I think about them in terms of how things have evolved into their present shape. I think this is the, uh, um, the, the contribution that history can make, and it makes it, uh, it, it almost uniquely. I don't think there's anything, there's any other line of study uh, that makes that contribution. And I, I feel that personally in my own life and I try to impart that to my students as well. What um, what about Lucretia specifically kind of stood out to you? Why did you want to learn about her? Because, I mean, I know for me, like I had never even heard of her until coming across the documentary. What, what was intriguing about her? Because it's interesting because she, her life, one could say, in the grand scheme of things, wasn't super, um, she didn't have a super powerful role. Um, in fact, it was more the people around her. Um, but what attracted you to her story and why did you want to learn more about her? Excellent question. Um, I, I, I've been interested in her for a long time, uh, long before... I became involved in the film that you uh, mentioned at the start of the uh, at the start of our of our interview. Um, I think I participated in that documentary. I believe it was 1998, if I'm not mistaken. So it's been a good 25 years ago that um, I participated in that project. But long before that, I was interested in her. Um, just because she was one of the most famous women of her time. And what always interested me about her, I think, um, as a student of history, is that here was Lucrezia Borgia, um, the daughter, as you said earlier, of Pope Alexander VI, uh, the Borgia Pope, um, uh, a woman who was an aristocrat, uh, she was in the elite class, and yet even for her, I mean, she was a victim of uh, not only her family, but uh, the, 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 the social cultural structures of the time and the way she's gone down in history, which I try to argue in the, uh, in the film, in the, in the documentary that we uh, mentioned, um, that her image has been a very unfortunate one. I tried to show in that documentary that she really does not deserve the evil reputation that she has. 
Uh, I don't know if you remember, but I mentioned somewhere in that program uh, the way uh, artists and historians of uh, subsequent generations have portrayed her as really one of the most depraved women in history. Yeah. Uh, guilty of uh, all sorts of uh, moral enormities, uh, including assassinations and so forth. Uh, but what I tried to show is that uh, a careful historical analysis of the evidence that we have for Lucrezia um, does not really justify uh, that uh, image of Lucrezia as a human symbol of depravity. Mm. Uh, in fact, there are two historians I consulted uh, for that documentary. One was William Roscoe, he was an, uh, uh, an 18th, late 18th, early 19th century historian, English, and a German historian of the 19th century, Ferdinand Gregor, Gregor Varius, um, who um, uh, showed uh, in, in a careful, detailed analysis of the documents of the time, letters, diaries, other evidence of that kind, uh, that uh, she really had been misrepresented uh, uh, and, and, and really did not merit the kind of uh, uh, opprobrium that had befallen her uh, in the pages of history. Uh, and, and so what I concluded from my investigation of Lucrezia was that even elite women uh, in that era, uh, even people from the upper classes, uh, were extremely vulnerable and and and, and, and an enormous uh, uh, at an enormous disadvantage in terms of the way the power structures of the time worked, and the way uh, historians remembered them. Um, uh, so I thought she was a fascinating example of a trend in the history of women uh, that was most lamentable. And most regrettable that uh, they they really um, were, as Simone de Beauvoir wrote in her 1948 book, they really were the second sex. In other words, not equal with uh, with men, and in the treatment they received and the uh, uh, the way they were remembered. Uh, so I thought she was just an endlessly fascinating example of an important theme in history. Um, and a fascinating person in her own right. I mean, the story of her life is, um, is, is I, to me, riveting. Uh, the way uh, she was used by her father and her brother, uh, Cesare Borgia, uh, who, who was really was one of the more depraved people of the time, um, how she was used as a pawn in their uh, family strategies to improve their power position in papal politics and the politics of Italy, the politics of Europe. Uh, she was peddled off in marriage at the age of 12 uh, to um, uh, uh, the son of a very famous uh, northern Italian family, uh, the Sforza family. Her first husband was Giovanni. Um, uh, and and her, 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 she was 12 years old, entering yeah. into that marriage. And uh, her father and brother uh, decided to uh, end that marriage for state reasons, to improve their alliance systems. Uh, they declared it uh, uh, unconsummated and with the intimation that her husband, Giovanni, uh, was uh, impotent and could not uh, uh, consummate the marriage, um, uh, which of course led him, as he resisted these charges, uh, to accuse um, uh, uh, Lucrezia and the other members of her family, particularly Pope Alexander VI and Cesare, of, uh, uh, of having uh, sexual relations with her, the father with the daughter, the brother with the sister. And so these, these images of Lucrezia passed into the historical record 
uh, and other other uh, wicked acts as well. And so this young 12 year old, uh, she's a very a, a pretty young girl, a very beautiful young girl, uh, 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 really became a kind of pawn in these uh, strategic political uh, geo strategic games. Um, and and as a result, uh, as as I say, these other more careful historians, Thayer and um, uh, William Roscoe, William Roscoe and and Gregor Overs, um, were able to show that this image of her really was false. Mm. I really undertook this film project, this documentary that you've seen, as a way to try to restore her reputation. And I think this is the, the sort of service that careful, honest historians are obligated to try to perform, not just in the case of Lucrezia, but wherever we, that, that sort of injustice um, has been perpetrated. What, for Lucrezia, I know um, it was mentioning in the documentary just a little bit, but to be a woman in the upper class in the Renaissance era was not um, not as romantic as one would think. Um, what, from your studies, what was and what would you say like an average life of a for Lucrezia? Also, I mean, she was illegitimate child supposedly of yeah. the Pope, so she yeah. also had that going, you know, against her. Um, but what would your typical um, royal life for a young girl look like in the renaissance period typical life of of the average woman of the renaissance we really don't know very much about mm. uh, simply because uh very few books were written about them the the lower middle classes uh had uh, much less attention paid to them uh, than the elites had paid, uh, than, than the elites received. Uh, so uh, it, it's really difficult to say with complete confidence uh, how the average person lived. I think this is one of the great changes in history that has taken place really in the last 150 years. Uh, historians have become much, much more interested uh, in working class people, in, in mm. lower class people, peasant cultures have received far more attention than they did in those earlier Renaissance times. So it's hard to say what the average person, um, how the average person lived in that time. Uh, I, I think many more efforts are being undertaken now by historians to try to get at those untold stories um uh, uh it, it's it's uh, i think it's one of the, the the more promising and and positive developments in the field of history that uh, uh historians have have a much more expansive mm. uh appreciation for history than formerly i i think it's it's true that uh in those earlier times historians were much more concerned about elites much more concerned about kings and generals and popes and queens, uh, and much less uh, so about people farther down on the social ladder. Um, uh, but I think, as I say, more work is coming out now. More, um, a, a much greater effort is being made to try to get at uh, some of those untold stories. Now, for back, if I remember correctly from what I, when I was studying this, Lucrezia, to be an illegitimate child of a pope in those times was actually not that strange. Is that true? It was actually something that was not, it was pretty common. I don't know how common it was, but it certainly happened. And Luke, and uh, Alexander the Sixth. Uh, who who is uh, has gone down in history as the worst pope of all time? I mean, he he he's his personal life, his um, his political life uh, were completely unprincipled. Uh, mm -hmm. 
he, he really had no belief in anything except his uh, his career and his sex life. Those are the two things that mattered to him. And here, here, here's the man who, who was the uh, the head of the Roman Catholic Church. And it's interesting to me that in this uh, depraved period of of history uh, for the Church, uh, that the Protestant Reformation was about to explode. Hmm. Uh, uh, Alexander the Sixth became Pope in 1492 and um, died in 1503. And the Protestant Reformation erupted in 1517, just uh, a little more than 10 years after his death, because so many people were outraged by uh, his appalling leadership. Uh, and some of the other, other popes of that period, uh, that uh, people like Martin Luther and uh, John Calvin, Ulrich Zwingli, the great famous Protestant reformers uh, found uh, a mass following uh, for their uh, breakaway uh, religious groups uh, right. because because of the depths to which the church had sunk morally under the leadership of men like the Borgia Pope Alexander the Sixth. So I think that's that's a, a very interesting. Uh, way to think about religious history that that, uh, that what what happened to the church in the Renaissance was an inspiration for the Protestant Reformation, which in what? turn caused the the church to engage in a counter Reformation later in the 16th century to try to clean up the church. Right. So there are many Catholic historians who argue that ironically. The Protestant Reformation was one of the best things ever to happen to the Roman Catholic Church because it it really forced the church hmm. to change its ways, which which had really become deplorable under uh, Alexander the Sixth and others in that period. What were some of the deplorable practices that something like Alexander the Sixth? What are some of the egregious things you've studied that he did that kind of would blacken the name of? doing anything in a religious sense, especially for the Catholic Church back then? I mean, he was all about power. He was all about advancing. I mean, you have to remember that in this period of the Renaissance, uh, the church not only was a religious institution, hmm. also was a political institution. It was a state. Uh, the, the papal territories constituted a, a one of the many... Uh, uh, independent entities on the Italian peninsula. There was several uh, states. Venice was one, Milan was another, Florence another, Naples. And, and, uh, and he was a power player hmm. in that uh, 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 political picture. And, and so the, the, the spiritual dimension of the church really uh, disappeared from view. In, 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 at least in Rome, at least in the in, uh, uh, in the precincts of papal power, um, and so in addition to all the the moral infractions that we've already talked about, the sexual irregularities of that period, you had these. Um, uh, the church really lost its way spiritually um, as a as a political power player. In the wars and in the various strategies of the of the of the Renaissance, um, it 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 lost its its um, it, its connection with Christ, hmm. and and there's nothing more important that you can lose as yeah. the Catholic Church than that. So I, I think it's fat. It's a fascinating time, a time of uh, in which the church sank to great depths then it rose again and it, and it you know this is a great period of religious art and if you go to italy and you you uh, go to the various churches the museums you see the work of michelangelo and raphael leonardo da vinci there's a whole host of great artists and writers and composers mm. who um really kept 
Catholic culture vibrant and and meaningful. Um, uh, so you, you just got so many different themes going on at the same time in mm -hmm. Renaissance. Themes of great tragedy and themes of soaring triumph. It's 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 endlessly fascinating. You can see how I became so interested in this as a young man when I first lived over there, and I I saw all this, and I thought, oh my goodness, this is how I want to spend my life is studying this and learning about it and and teaching people about it through my my courses at the university and and um, and and the books I write, and and I've been very fortunate to be able to do both of those things for a very long time. Now, for Lucretia, if I remember correctly, she did, so after her marriage with her first husband was annulled, she yeah. did marry again, and then the second time she married, it was actually, um, it was one she wanted, wasn't it? This is Someone true. Someone that she really did love. After marrying Giovanni Sforza, that was her first husband. The Sforzas were a famous Milanese aristocratic family, and, and that ended for reasons we've already discussed. Then she married uh, a young man, Alfonso was his name, Alfonso, the Duke of Bichelie. He was the son of the King of Naples. This is another power marriage that her father and brother arranged. Uh, brother, of course, being Cesare. Uh, and um, this, as you have said, uh, this was a happy marriage. They had a child, Rodrigo, little Rodrigo, came into the world fairly soon after their marriage. She was married at 18 to him. The first marriage, she was 12. Second marriage, she was 18. Had this child, very happy with the child, very happy with her husband. He was a handsome young guy. She's a beautiful young, it's like a the perfect power couple in Rome. But then, because of political changes in Italy, military changes, uh, her father decided once again that we're going to have to get her out of this marriage in order to get her into another one that will be more advantageous for us. Um, uh, politically and strategically and economically. Mm -hmm. And so they were just using her all the time. It didn't matter what she wanted or what she thought. Uh, they actually killed, uh, Cesare actually killed uh, the second husband, Alfonso, the Duke of Bichelia. You know, I mean, she was devastated. As you can, you can imagine how the, the father of her child, the the man she loved, the man she was finding fulfillment with, and he's taken from her, and they 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 kill him. Doesn't um, the documentary mention too that she, after that happened, she was, it was in she was in such a state of lament and grief that even her father and her brother didn't want to see her her grief at all. She was kind of so kind of shut away from her. Yeah, I think that's that that's more or less what happened. There was a, a long period uh, in which she was just devastated and and uh, and unable to uh, to function normally, uh, which I think is perfectly understandable given the to the trauma of an event like that. Um, but you know, eventually she um, at age twenty one um, was married a third time. Uh, another man named Alfonso, the Duke of Este, uh, which was another very important principality in Renaissance Italy. Uh, 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 Alfonso d'Este uh, presided over a very um, uh, um, artistic uh, court, uh, many important writers there, many important painters. Um, uh, it, it seems, again, uh, documentation is pretty sparse for many of the periods of her life. We don't really know everything we'd like to know about how she developed after that uh, the tragedy of her uh, second husband's death to the point where 
after marrying the third time um, in, uh, at age 21, uh, she appears to, she, first of all, she had a number of more children, a large family, and uh, uh, appears to have found some kind of stability at that point. First of all, her father, her, her father died. That was one big plus in her life, getting him out of the picture. And her brother died. Cesare died. Uh, father died in 1503. Brother died in 1507. He was only 30 when he died. Um, uh, but uh, Lucrezia, from that point on, I think once she was out of the orbit of her father and her brother, both nefarious men, no question about that. But once she was free of them, uh, she was able to lead uh, what what uh, Roscoe, the historian I mentioned earlier, William Roscoe, um, and uh, uh, other the other historians who were very careful in trying to examine the documentary evidence that we have for Lucrezia's life. Um, they, 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 she entered a period of, of calm in her life, period of stability. Uh, she became, by all accounts, she became at that point, getting into her later 20s, I mean, she died at 39. She had, she did not live long either. Mm. Um, uh, I think she, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, she died in, in childbirth. Um, but uh, we know that um, uh, she became much more of a mother, much more of a wife, much much more of a normal. She had much more of a normal existence at that point. She wasn't being palmed around the way she was earlier in her life by a manipulative father and a, a, a really uh, uh, extremely exploitative brother. Um, and so her life became increasingly uh, fulfilling to her and, and uh, she became very religious. She became a patron of the arts and literature. And, and that, that's what led uh, Roscoe, uh, one of her great biographers, mm. uh, to conclude that, these images of her earlier life uh, are, are at the very least overdrawn and possibly completely fabricated. And so we really need to reevaluate our estimate of Lucrezia Borgia. She, she was a much different person by nature and in terms of what the historical record shows than uh, would be ind indicated by the uh, image she has in the history books. And Why I think has that image you think perpetrated so long? Because you would think there would be even a natural leaning toward perhaps um, thinking better of her because she was a woman in that time period. Um, but why do you think the image of before what seems like started by a rumor by her first husband yeah. um became so prominent above what actually people would experience and see because even the documentary mentioned by the end of her life the people closest to her were super grieved even her husband was very grieved at her loss when she died um because they said she was just a very kind person very not motherly a, like you mentioned um, not, a, not only was she kind and um uh, and 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 religious and uh, very uh caring of the people around her but she was a very good administrator her her husband often turned important uh, administrative political tasks over to her whenever he was away on business or diplomacy wherever whenever he might be taken out of ferrara hmm. she was in charge I mean, he trusted her completely, her judgment, her discretion, her sense of what to do in any given political situation. He thought that she was up to the task. So, yeah, I mean, th there are all these positive things to say about her. So your question, why has this image of Lucrezia, the, 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 uh, the murderess and the faithless lover and uh, sexual adventurous, why has this image of her 
persisted for so long? Well, I think one answer to that question has to do with Italy's greatest historian. He's a man named Francesco Guicciardini. Uh, his, his classic six-volume history of Italy is sort of the foundational historical interpretation of the country. Mm. It's a great book. Um, Guicciardini was a, a papal administrator. He was not a priest, but he was a, a secular administrator in the in the uh, in the church, uh, and so he 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 knew the Borgias and hated them, mm. and uh, really helped to start this vendetta against Lucrezia and all the Borgias. He hated all father brothers, says all of them, and so his portrayal of the Borgias. Um, uh, uh, really has had an enduring influence mm. on on not only the historiography of the period, but the art of the period. The, for example, uh, I, I believe I mentioned this in the program. It's been a long time since I, I, I participated in that program, but I'm pretty sure we mentioned uh, the opera by uh, uh, yes. uh, Lucrezia Borgia, uh, the a, a, a play uh, 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 also written about her in the 19th century that really helped to perpetuate this image of Lucrezia the reprobate. And, and, and so one generation after another right. has enforced this image until, as I say, I mean, the, the tide began to turn in the 19th century, I hope our documentary made it turn even more. That was my purpose, to try to show how these revisionist historians, people like Roscoe, uh, Grigorovius, uh, were, were able to, um, to begin to teach us to think about her in a radically different way and to get away from the rumors Get away from the innuendo based on nothing but uh, uh, but unsubstantiated uh, uh, attacks on her, and and to go by what the historical record actually showed. The historical record showed a very different person from the one in the history books with the name of Lucrezia Borgia. She she, uh, we, I mean, she, it's not that that we can think of. Lucrezia as the perfect person, uh, she she grew up in that atmosphere of the Borgia family. That's that was what her training was. So th th there's no doubt that that those early years mm. had an effect on her. That that probably was not positive. Uh, certainly wasn't positive. But she grew, and she developed into a person. Uh, quite admirable in many crucial respects. And so uh, that that image of, in fact, another historian, uh, uh, Edward Gibbon, the author of The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, an 18th century work of history, really echoed um, uh, uh, the, the earlier consensus about Lucrezia, uh, calling her in his famous book, Came out in 1776, uh, calling her the Messalina of um, of, of Renaissance Rome. Mm. And Messalina, of course, was a figure from ancient classical Roman history, the, the most infamous woman of that period, a, a sexual um, uh, adventuress of the most exalted <laughs> kind or the most depraved kind, and and so. Uh, uh, rather than linking Lucrezia with the worst women in history, which has been the the custom, uh, I, I think the trend has more and more been in her favor. I mean, to think of her as a person who performed great good in her life, who um, uh, really does not merit the kind of obliterating indictment that uh, that she has received. What is there anything written in the historical record of her actually writing something of her own, like 
expressing some thought or like some diary or anything or is most of what we have based on other people's well, what they was, saw yeah. she's very interested in literature she's a very a very serious student of literature and language in fact she was uh, um a, a great patroness of a renaissance writer of that period named pietro bembo very famous italian writer uh, so she was in a, in a, I mean, of course, uh, many people thought she was having an affair with him because of her natural proclivity for that sort of thing. No evidence for that at all. That, that's been, been completely disproved by people who've studied the record as carefully as it can be studied for something like that. But in any case, yeah, she was very interested in literature and uh, wrote letters and, and, uh, uh, reflected on uh especially spiritually toward the end of her, in her later years uh, uh on on religion and on the importance of religion so i mean we have uh, we have a, a a paper trail to follow with her but nothing that would really uh in an exhaustive way right which is we've been talking about so just trying to wrap up because i so appreciate your time. Um, what do you think, what is one area of history that you really want to see grow in the next decade or so? Well, that's an excellent question. And I wish we had a whole hour to talk about that. But <laughs> I'll, I'll try to compress my thoughts in, in the minute or so we have left. Uh, I, I think that what... What we need more than anything else um, in the field of history is to learn from the great historians. I think of the great ones being Thucydides, uh, Tacitus uh, in the ancient world. Uh, and and, and they, they have many admirers in the history profession uh, in later periods down to our own time. But to think uh, more about history um, as a critical discipline. You know, rather than thinking of history as something to be memorized, something to um, be entertained by, but to think of it as a treasure trove of examples from the past about how we can learn to deal with our problems of today, political problems, economic problems, moral problems, I think history is a great repository of uh, of insights uh, about how we can cope <clears throat> with the problems that we're confronted with in the modern world. Mm. And so I, I think that aspect of history is, uh, to some extent, been forgotten. It's been overlooked. It is not paid adequate attention to. Mm. Uh, and that would be my hope. And that's sort of what I try to promote in my own teaching and my own writing um, uh, to, to, to encourage people to look to the past for guidance to the future. Hmm. Well, again, listeners, this is Richard Drake. I'm speaking to him about Lucretia, um, which was the daughter who was the daughter of a Pope back in the 15th century. Just a really fascinating story. I highly encourage you to do your own research on it because this is we barely touched all the things they talked about, but it was really great to just be able to get a synopsis of it. But Richard, I want to thank you so much. I mean, this was a pleasure and I really enjoyed it. Pleasure was all mine.